the first thing I want to do is thank everybody who's joining me right now. I know it's been a long day, and I know that cognitive load is real. I mean, you've covered a lot of really technical topics and, you know, been at it all day. And so I really appreciate you for hanging in there and waiting for my talk, which is coming at the end of a long day. Um, why are you listening to me? I mean, what do I have to share? Well, I'm a cyber generalist. I don't claim to be a master of anything. Uh, as a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure folks out in the audience are much more technical and masters of a lot more aspects of cybersecurity than I am. But what I do claim is that I know a little bit about a lot <laughs> across all the domains of cyber, enough to be dangerous. And I've been doing it a long time, going back to the 80s, uh, depending on how you define cyber and how you characterize the work. I'm coming to you this morning from San Diego, California in the United States. And again, I wanna thank Roomcast for letting me uh, go at the end of the itinerary, at the end of the agenda, so that I could be joining you this morning or this afternoon for you guys. Um, I teach as a side hustle. <laughs> I do have a day job. I'm a staff security engineer at G2Ops. That's where I work. But I also teach graduate students cybersecurity at National University. And I'm also a certified coach for psychological safety. Um, there's an organization called Leader Factor that Dr. Timothy Clark, who is the author of the four stages of psychological safety, has stood up. And I went through that training and I am certified in, in psychological safety coaching. And then in general, I'm very passionate about ethics in technology and equi equity in tech. And I think that it's giving back to the community by being an educator. And so that's what I like to do. It, um, when I'm not at work, I like to give back by teaching on the side and contributing to podcasts and whatever, whatever I can do to do my part to help spread the word um, about the important aspects of cybersecurity, security, and IT ops. A note about um, the talk today, we've got Susanna on the line and she's gonna be looking at chat in case you guys have any questions. Please feel free to pose questions throughout the talk if something triggers something for you. Or if you prefer, you can wait until the end. I'll try to end so that there's time for us to have a Q&A session in case folks don't want to chime in or interrupt. Okay, so I hope to share some tips with you today about how you can build strong relationships on your SEC and ops teams, because without those relationships, without those connections between the people, uh, your teams are going to be hindered. And that's my perspective, is that it's always about the people, people first, and we need to be focusing on, you know, the humanity on our teams. So often it's easy to forget that there are people we're talking about. And so let's find a way to get back to the humanness of engaging with each other. So very broadly, I'm going to be talking about the importance of culture and SecOps teams. Um, culture has an impact on innovation and speed. Um, what we do know is almost 80% of CEOs is focused on innovation these days. And, you know, we're looking for innovation in pretty much every aspect of our work and jobs. Um, don't forget innovation is how we do things better. And so culture, since culture is such an important aspect and foundation of providing trust and safety, uh, innovation will spawn more easily when we have psychologically safe teams. So we'll talk about culture, why it matters. We'll talk about the impacts that culture has on innovation. We're gonna go a little bit deep into psychological safety, not too deep, but deeper than the first two. And then we'll end with some Q&A at the end. End. Okay, so why even think about culture? Well, it's critical in security operations because we're talking about values, beliefs, behaviors that kind of make us do 
things the way that we do. It governs how we interact and function on our teams. And the important thing about culture is it's rarely written down. It's rarely codified, thou shalt act this way, thou shalt do this way. It's more something that we pick up and get cues from our peers and our leaders within our teams. Um, what is our culture when lunchtime rolls around? Do we all get up and go together to go outdoors and get some fresh air and get something good to eat? Or do we all tend to sit at our desks and eat our lunch so that we can power through and maybe knock off early? That's a cultural thing. Um, it's not something that people will necessarily say, this is what we do, but it's something that we can pick up from cues. So what's important about culture is that leaders on the teams model the culture that they want to see in the teams. Like parents and children, children model the behaviors that they see in their parents. Similarly, in work teams, employees and team members will model the behavior that they see in their leaders. So I, I say this to all the leaders on the line right now, if you're interested in changing the culture of your team, then you need to think about what you're going to model for behaviors to set that example for your team. Um, leaders and first followers, and if you don't know what a first follower is, I highly recommend you search first follower in YouTube and look at the dancing dude. Um, but leaders and first followers are really the catalyst for getting cultural changes onto your teams. So having a strong positive culture that's modeled by your leaders can fuel your productivity, fuel proactivity, um, enable better decision making, make communications a lot more clear because people will be more trusting and fearless. Um, it will also lead to overall improved morale. People may even have fun at work. Imagine <laughs> the concept of having fun at work. Um, and of course, enhanced performance. So we need to care about culture because culture matters. Culture is the underlying drive that motivates our teams to do things the way that they do it. And we should care about it for two reasons. The first reason is we care about our people, so we should care about our culture. And the second reason is our bosses care about our culture because innovation depends on it. So just a real high level um, touch point on why culture needs to matter to us in very highly technical teams like security and IT ops and why some of the touchy feely subjects, the subjects that a lot of folks like to call the soft skills, but I know and I think you guys know they're really the hard skills. Uh, I think people skills are a lot more challenging for some and technical skills in some cases may be easier to pick up. Um, so I don't call it the soft skills, but this is why culture matters. So I already mentioned that having a strong culture and a culture of psychological safety will foster innovation. And the reason it does that is when people feel trusting and safe, then they're free to experiment and throw out their cockamamie ideas like, oh, let's think outside the box. How can we solve this problem? People do not want to do that if they're in an environment where someone might laugh at them or think, oh, that was a dumb idea, or even ridicule or name or shame them because of their idea, laugh at them. These are all behaviors that may seem harmless on the surface, but could really hurt somebody. Um, and I, I know I'm getting at how we're making people feel, but that's the important part. We need to remember that everybody on our teams 
are humans and they probably have the similar goals to what we all have. They want a good life, a happy life to be able to provide for their families and their children and pets. And they want to do good work. I doubt there's very many people on our teams that wake up every morning and say, I want to do bad work today. And I want to disappoint everybody on my team. Honestly, there's nobody that wakes up and says they're going to do that that day, even though we may feel that there are folks out there <laughs> that are trying to do that to us. Honestly, we have to assume positive intent and remember that that person may be having a bad day. That person may have a lot of stuff going on that we have no idea you know, we have no clue about because they have a family at home. They have pressures at home. They have requirements beyond this job that could be affecting their ability to think outside the box or contribute to your process. So looking at how this you know, culture fosters innovation and how a positive, supportive culture can help your team members think outside the box and share their ideas without fear um, will help you challenge the status quo. Because eventually what you want are people that are fearless and brave enough to say, I know that's how we've always done it, but why do we have to keep doing it that way? Let's try it this way instead and challenge popular opinion, challenge status quo. Some of the best ideas spawn from situations like this where people are just free and safe and brave to spitball and brainstorm and think, what if? Um, innovative ideas and solutions sometimes pop up like that, and you can significantly improve your team's ability to do this. And this will actually help you recognize and defend against cyber threats more quickly. It will allow you to surge and swarm problems more effectively because when your teams trust each other and have positive intentions for each other and don't assume that everything that someone else is saying is coming from a negative space, these are all pragmatic tips that we can intentionally practice ourselves. We can tell ourselves, I assume positive intent from that person. I'm assuming that request comes from a place of positivity, not negativity. So I'm not going to infer something negative in their tone because it came over Slack and Slack is a cool medium and I can't see what their tone or body language is. So it is, it's a, it's a, it's a choice that we make to assume positive intent to proactively support positivity in our engagements and on our teams and to not abide or allow a lot of negativity. You know, sometimes people do need to let off steam and maybe they need to complain a little bit about something, but we can't allow ourselves the luxury to just sit and wallow in the negativity. At some point, we need to get up and do something positive about it to try and change and improve the situation. So remember, when we talk about innovation, it's not the creativity and the good ideas necessarily. Creativity is having the good idea. Implementation is putting it into practice and innovation is implementation. So it's very important that we foster psychological safety and trust on our teams so that we can entice and get these, these great solutions from our folks. Um, from fearless team members who aren't afraid to share their ideas with us. And we do that as leaders by providing psychologically safe environments and by modeling the behavior we want to see in our teams. So innovation and speed, a lot of times in technology markets, being first to being first to market is the, the key, being fast and being first out there. And so you'll feel a lot of pressure on your teams to go faster. Well, in the military, sometimes you hear the phrase slow is smooth and smooth is fast. Well, a safe culture can lead to faster decision making because a safe culture knows 
that the collective wisdom of the team is sound, that people are have already demonstrated their positive intent, they're not being sarcastic or jaded or cynical, they're actually serious about their, their suggestion or idea, no matter how far-fetched it may sound. Positive culture directly impacts the speed and ability of a SecOps team because it fosters trust and open communication and decision making, you know, is faster because the collective wisdom of the team has been proved. Um, being able to communicate clearly and effectively also fosters faster decision making and it will help folks identify threats more quickly because if you have an environment where he who brings the bad news gets shot on the spot, people are not going to give you the bad news. And honestly, as leaders, we need the bad news. We need the bad news soon. As soon as we know about it, tell us, because really what we're looking for is time, time to react, time to adjust, maybe time to deal with whatever that threat might be. If folks are scared to say something about what they see because they're afraid the bad news is going to be met with shooting the messenger, then they're, they're going to hold that information from you. So it's, again, back to the leader to model the behavior that we wish to see, and that means we're going to have to welcome bad news. Now, we don't have to necessarily celebrate it, but it is important that we demonstrate that it is safe for folks on the team to come with bad news. And as the leader, that falls solely squarely on your shoulders. So there are practical things that you can do to encourage folks to come forward with bad news or problems that they think they see because they need to be comfortable expressing their thoughts and ideas. Um, so there are some practical steps to cultivate these positive changes in your culture. Um, psychological safety, which is something we're gonna talk about in a little more detail in a few slides. Um, psychological safety where everyone feels comfortable expressing their thoughts and opinions, even bad news. Um, we need to encourage innovation by welcoming new ideas, fostering an environment of continuous learning, continuous learning. In order to learn, we have to unlearn stuff. In order to learn, we may have to fail a few times. Will we tolerate failures? Can we tolerate failures? The key is knowing when and where you can fail and fail safely so that it doesn't affect production, it doesn't affect your clients, it doesn't affect your mission. Um, but we must accommodate failures because some folks don't learn without the lesson that comes from a failure. And so we need to embrace failures as well as bad news. And we can do that practically by asking people how they failed. For example, it's just one tip. We need to facilitate open and clear communications, good news and bad news, so that we can improve our speed and agility and we can respond to threats more quickly and decisively. So I think that if we are trying to foster innovation and we need to do it quickly, one of the foundational things is to foster psychological safety, to let your teams know that there will be no naming, shaming, or blaming, that they are encouraged to come forth with bad news or problems that they think they see because there's no other way to help solve that without someone bringing it forward. So psychological safety. I, for one, don't think that we can overstate the importance of psychological safety. Psychological safety, to me, I think of like Maslow's hierarchy of physical needs and physical safety. And I'm pretty sure most folks in the audience are familiar with Maslow's pyramid and how physically the foundational physical safety elements are needed before we can get to the apex of the pyramid and do the more higher level things. The example here is that 
if a person doesn't have their basic physical needs like food, water, air, and shelter met, they're not going to be able to do higher order mathematics for you. They're worried about, you know, diapers for the baby and, you know, food to put on the table and where are they going to sleep? And so it's important for us to remember that lower level needs need to be met first before higher level needs can be addressed. The same can be said about psychological safety. There are foundational elements to psychological safety that need to be met first before higher level things like challenging status quo can be safely attempted by folks. And so it's important for us to understand that people cannot be punished or bullied or humiliated when they speak up with ideas or opinions or concerns or mistakes. How we respond in that moment when someone brings forward a problem is very important. And it's more than just the words we say, it's, it's, and I'm going to caveat this, this is all easier said than done. I will be the first to tell you it's very difficult to practice all these tips that are we're going to be talking about to be psychologically safe because we're human and there are things that peeve us and there are things that are irritating and we do get frustrated. We're not perfect. We are humans. Um, and so this is a practice and this requires intention and so we have to want to do this and we have to learn about it and then we have to put it into practice and when we mess up and we are going to mess up great we're going to learn from it and we're going to be able to use it as a positive example for our teams so that they see, hey, even the leader's human, even the leader makes mistakes, even the leader gets upset occasionally, but we can get through this because we're all human. The belief that we're not going to be humiliated or punished for speaking our minds, that's fundamentally what psychological safety is. Now, the way of working has changed so significantly because of our internet evolution, uh, revolution, um, the ways of working from way back in the day uh, don't apply anymore. And so having authoritative, having authoritative top down orders, that just doesn't seem to fly anymore, especially when we have agile teams and DevOps and SecOps, and we're trying to go as fast as we can to provide value and delight to our customers. So it's very foundational for us to make sure that psychological safety is um, an, el you know, an element of our strong culture. Um, we need to be able to admit mistakes. We need to be able to ask questions. We need to be able to do this without fear or punishment. Um, and we need to be able to allow our team members to communicate openly, to be honest about their mistakes, honest about their vulnerabilities, and for all of us on the teams to work together to address these security threats effectively. So according to Dr. Tim Clark, the author of the four stages of psychological safety and the creator of the search the certification that I went through, psychological safety is really a ladder of vulnerability where the safer we feel, the more vulnerable we will be. And I know that that probably sounds diametrically opposed to some. How can we be safe How if we're vulnerable? How can we be brave if we're vulnerable? But those are actually on the same spectrum. We cannot be vulnerable unless we feel safe, and we cannot be uh, trusting and transparent without being vulnerable. We cannot be brave without being vulnerable either. I offer that bravery is something that we do when we are vulnerable because we face the fear and do it anyway. So taking those steps on the four stages of psychological safety is actually advancing your position up a ladder of vulnerability where you are completely exposed and you're really putting forth your best 
most out of the box ideas, but you feel safe that your team's not going to ridicule or humiliate you for, for putting forth this idea. And so you go ahead and share it. The relevance of that is that it encourages open communication and the benefits is that you guys are trusting, your teams are trusting and brave enough to identify and share security threats, to identify and share new ideas, and maybe come up with that next innovation, that, that next market changing innovation. So I want to take this time to get a little closer into the four stages of psychological safety. and name them and then talk a little bit about them. So the four stages, according to Dr. Clark, are inclusion, learner safety, contributor safety, and challenger safety. Now, just like I was saying with Dr. Maslow's physical pyramid, you can't get to challenger safety that comfortably if your teams don't foster inclusion, learner safety, and contributor safety. It, it happens a lot more easily if all these things are, are built upon together, if everyone is included, if everyone is adopting a learning mindset and is safe to learn and fail and learn from their failures, relearn, unlearn, and if folks are safe to contribute ideas, bring ideas without being ridiculed or shamed. So it's easy to see that if you want to be a challenger, if you want folks to challenge the status quo and challenge popular opinion, it's going to be important that you provide inclusion on your teams, that everyone is included. Um, inclusion is owed to people just for being human. Inclusion is owed. It is not earned. That's a very important point. So include everybody and follow some of the tips that we're going to talk about in a minute to practice inclusion on your teams and make people feel welcome and seen and heard. After inclusion safety, we need to make sure everyone feels safe to learn. Learning like we used to learn when we were kids in school. Do you remember how it felt to get a question wrong in class? We don't want our teams feeling that way. So that's the feeling that we're trying to get rid of in our teams when we're trying to solve problems or innovate new solutions and create new ways of doing things, building better mousetraps. We need to be safe to relearn how we used to do things, unlearn those things, and learn new things from each other by being inclusive and bringing everybody to the table. We might be able to innovate and learn a new way of doing something. And when we get to that point, we're, we feel safe and heard and brave enough to con contribute these ideas to the group. Think about all the introverts out there that don't want to speak up. They just don't want the spotlight or, you know, the introverts that are quiet. It, it takes extra courage and extra bravery on their part to contribute an idea. Some folks don't like to talk over other people. Some folks just won't speak up unless they're specifically called on. So think about these practical aspects when we're trying to encourage these behaviors in our teams, because ultimately we want everybody to feel comfortable in all four quadrants, depending on the situation and the types of solutions that we need. So for inclusion, again, it's not earned, it is owed to everybody, all team members, and they must be included to foster growth and you cannot have innovation without inclusion. Um, if you do have innovation, it's gonna be severely limited to just the group that is included. Uh, that's not ideal. And I think that you know our problems with retaining talent in technology industries will continue. Uh, these are very valuable, highly sought after skilled people. You don't wanna lose your teammates. So it's very important to include them, to support them in their learning lifelong learning, giving them the freedom to unlearn and relearn how to do things, to try and fail and try again, 
Failure is not a bad thing. Failure is an opportunity. Failure is an opportunity to learn. So the key for leaders is to provide an environment where it's safe to fail and where the failures are not going to have a negative impact on your mission or your product. It's important that folks be allowed to fail without shame or embarrassment. I think especially for parents, if your child is trying to learn a new skill, it, you know, the lesson completely translates. You don't want to embarrass or humiliate your child. They may be too afraid to try again. Same thing for our workers and our employees and our teammates. You know, we want to make sure that they feel safe enough to learn, safe enough to fail so that they will continue to try and contribute. I mean, contributors feel safe and uh, they're brave. They offer their ideas. Um, honestly, you're going to have a hole where some ideas would be if folks don't feel safe to contribute or if they don't feel like their contributions are valued, if they're not felt seen or even heard or recognized. So, Make sure that you're able to recognize when someone on your team is contributing something and it, acknowledge the contributions and express gratitude. And when people feel truly safe, and as leaders, we should all strive for this, we want our folks to feel safe enough to challenge us when they think that the decision we're about to make is flawed or missing a key piece of information. We want our folks brave enough to challenge us to challenge status quo, to go against the popular opinion, even if it's six against one, say your piece, be brave enough to challenge. And then as long as you've made your advice, you know, be wise enough to know when, when the leader has made the decision, if they have chosen to accept the risk and move on. But as long as you provide your input and you challenge that, I feel you've done your due diligence. Don't do any of these things to get crossed up with your boss. <laughs> That's not going to help either. So just some pictures to show the power of inclusion and learner safety. We don't want to be this guy. I'm pretty sure everybody in the audience remembers what it felt like to be this person called on. And oh my goodness, I don't know the answer. Are they going to laugh at me if I say the wrong thing? We want to avoid having our team members feel like this in our meetings, in our brainstorming sessions. We want to be able to contribute and bring our good ideas and our ways of looking at problems to the team because what we know or contribute may be the key to finding that next new innovation. And again, breaking down those walls, we want to be able to challenge status quo, challenge popular opinion, and be brave enough to put forth our, uh, our ideas. <laughs> Excuse me. So to foster inclusion, leaders teach inclusion as a basic human need and a basic human right. Don't act like inclusion is earned. People do not need to be need to earn the right to be included. If they're on your team, they're on your team, they should be included. Uh, so teach that to your teams and model that. Another thing that you can do, introduce yourself at the first opportunity. If you're the leader or you're there already part of the in group, then take that first step to welcome the new person and you introduce yourself first. Here's one that I think is really important and I try this myself diligently. Learn people's names and how to pronounce them. And if you don't know how to say a person's name, then ask them, ask them how they say their name, and then you say it back and do that as many times as it takes for you to learn their name. Nothing is more sweet than a person's name and hearing someone say it to them. So learn your team members' names and how to properly pronounce them. Listen and pause when someone is speaking and listen 
to hear what the person is saying. Don't listen to formulate your next response. And another thing that you can do to foster inclusion as a leader, as, as a leader on the team, and that doesn't mean you're the boss, it just means you're a leader and you don't have to be in a position of authority to be a peer leader or a first follower. Physically face people. When someone is speaking to you, face them, meet them face to face, engage the human that's in front of you. <laughs> that's what I hope is coming through, that we need to get back to the humanity of this. We're all people trying to do good work. Let's face each other, learn each other's names, say each other's names. A few tips on what we can do to foster inclusion. And later I provide some resources where you can go look for a lot more tips on how to foster each of these uh, four practices, four areas of psychological safety. For learner safety, for this young man here at the, the chalkboard, share what you're learning as a leader, as a peer leader, as a first follower. Be vocal about the fact that you're continuously learning, that you're a lifelong learner, and share what you're learning. It will encourage other people to talk about what they're learning. As a leader, I think it's important for you to be vulnerable and share your past mistakes by modeling that it's okay and even successful people, people who become the boss, have made mistakes in the past is a very powerful lesson for folks coming behind you to learn. It helps them feel a little better knowing that they can make mistakes and survive. And it's not a zero-sum game or a zero tolerance, a zero fault game. Um, we do need to be able to try and fail. We need to be able to make mistakes so that we can learn from them. Another thing you can do to foster learner safety is to ask questions to activate learning. In other words, like the Socratic method, practice answering questions by asking questions in a way that has the listener go back and think more deeply and maybe provide the answer themselves by asking the question in a different way. And like I said earlier, celebrate failures. <laughs> We've got to welcome failures. We've got to celebrate bad news. We've got to make it to where it's all right for people to tell us as soon as possible because the last thing you want as a leader is for people to hold on to bad news and to hold on to mistakes and failures until you've got no time to react or respond. Really what you're looking for is time so that you can come up with mitigations or a way to remediate the issue, but you can't get that if folks don't feel safe enough to tell you about their mistake or a failure that they've witnessed or observed or that they see coming. If you're the type of leader that shoots the messenger, they're not going to tell you if they see a train wreck approaching. So try to foster learning by admitting when you don't know something, saying, I don't know, to admit your own ignorance is also a very powerful lesson for leaders, for leaders to demonstrate and model. The next one is contributor safety, this, this box of groceries. To foster contributor safety, you can do things like rotate the con conduct of meetings. So don't be the only one who runs the meetings if you're the leader assign someone else to run the meeting and rotate it regularly so that everybody gets a chance and everybody is used to hearing their voice be more direct and uh, leading the team through status updates or sprint retrospectives, whatever the meeting might be, rotate the conduct of that meeting and that will foster contributor safety. The other thing you can do is don't correct with anger. When someone contributes a new idea and it is not necessarily the quote unquote right way to go, the last thing you want to do is to correct that contribution with anger or some type of negative emotion. If anything, you want to be very rational and reasonable. Try not to be cold. Try to be warm and explain and help them learn and understand why, from your perspective, that isn't necessarily the right approach. 
This one, I believe firmly, you've probably you've heard me say it a number of times in this presentation, but never name, shame, or blame, and don't tolerate it um, because it's gossip. It's gossip when it happens behind someone's back, when it's in front of somebody, it's humility, it's humiliating for many. And so it's very important that if there is a mistake or an error, that the ultimate goal is to get the lesson from there. What can we learn from this failure? Where can we test earlier in the process to avoid this failure? That should be what we're trying to get at. Not who did it, not why did you do it, not what were you thinking, never name, shame, or blame if someone comes to you with an idea, suggestion, solution, or problem, just avoid it. It doesn't, it doesn't motivate folks. And if it does motivate them, it motivates them with fear. Fear of displeasing you, fear of getting on the wrong side of you. And I don't know about you, but that makes me feel bad as a leader. When I think someone, it's like if you go to approach your dog or your cat and they flinch, it's like, why are you flinching? <laughs> I'd never raise my hand to you. Why, why are you afraid of me? You don't want people on your teams being afraid of you and having a psychological flinch because you name, shame, or blame. Sorry to hit on that so strongly, but I feel very, I feel very strongly about that. Another thing to do to foster contri contributions and contributor safety is to celebrate small wins. All of our work can be such a grind, especially when we're doing DevOps and DevSecOps and SecOps. Everything is just continuous, continuous everything, continuous value, continuous learning. And it's almost like we never get to the point to where we can say, yay, we did something great. So find a way to celebrate those small wins. And if someone brings you a good idea or brings you, hey, I finally made it through this process, it was a tough one, let's celebrate that. Because if we fail to celebrate the small wins, then the whole thing becomes one big long grind that never has an end. And what are they working for anyway now? What are we doing if we can't celebrate some of the small wins that we're experiencing on a day in day out basis? And then the last thing I'd like to suggest as, as a leader fostering contributor safety is shifting from telling to asking. And that's a powerful tool in and of itself. Instead of telling somebody what to do, you can ask them to help you understand how they came to that suggestion, how they came to that course of action. And ask with genuine interest and intent to understand. Again, it comes back to our intentions. It comes back to positivity. It comes back to trying to get at the underlying, why is this, you know, why, why are you doing this and help me understand. And the last thing I wanna talk about is to foster challenger safety. Like we were assigning the content, you know, who conducts meetings, you can assign dissent in your meetings. Imagine assigning someone to play devil's advocate. I want you to be the role of dissenter during this meeting, and you're going to speak up, please, if you, um, if you hear any suggestions, and you're going to play devil's advocate, and you're going to tell us why that probably won't work. That gives people freedom to challenge, freedom to go against the popular opinion, and freedom to dig out maybe some of those things we may have missed if everybody's just saying yes. You as the leader need to respond constructively to bad news, wait to weigh in last, don't speak first, mandate a no interruption rule during the meetings so that folks don't feel like um, they're being challenged as they're challenging, and ask for bad news. I'm being mindful of the clock and how long you guys have been at this today, so I'm going to speed up a little bit. Fostering psychological safety, again, encourage open communication, 
You need to promote and reward transparency on your teams, welcome bad news, assume positive intent from your folks, assume positive intent even when you, you your emotional reaction is, oh, they're insulting me. No, assume what would make this true for them and assume they're coming from a place of goodness. Avoid the anti-patterns of naming, shaming, and blaming. Don't indulge or tolerate it in your teams. That's gossip, and gossip just demoralizes and chips away at your unit cohesion and esprit de corps. Um, don't punish curiosity. Don't punish mistakes. Try to find the lessons in them. And... Try to find strategies to encourage psychological safety. Learn about this more yourself. Model this behavior on your teams and show your folks that um, we're all here. We're all humans. We all want to do a good job. We're all here working for the same thing. And we have so much more in common than we have differences. And so when we remember to address each other as humans and to just engage with each other one-on-one -on -one as people, a lot of good things can happen from that. And with that, I'm going to conclude my talk. I'm two minutes over. I apologize. There's some references here on the screen. And if there's time, I would like to take some questions, but I totally understand if we need to end here. Thank you very much, RuneCast and Susanna, for having me and for accommodating my schedule. And thank you, everybody who's on the line for sticking with it all day. I know the cognitive load is real. I hope that you learned a few tips and tricks and that you go back to your teams and model that great behavior of fostering psychological safety. Thank you.